The main takeaways I've been able to get from the Japanese Grand Prix is that two intra-team battles are looking desperately awkward. And I think you can guess at least one of those. So even though the Japanese Grand Prix resulted in yet another 1-2 for a particular manufacturer, it did have its moments regarding certain strategy calls. And wouldn't you know it, I almost would consider this a win, but Sauber were able to have pit stops that weren't in double figures today. I'm still not going to put you in the winner's circle, but I'm certainly going to put in Max Verstappen because come on, what more do I need to say? I knew he'd be coming back off the back of the Australian Grand Prix, driving angrily. And then of course he went on to win the Grand Prix and yes he did have to fight for it a little bit in quali but during the race he seemed much more assured as the car came to him because initially he was reporting understeer and then of course Checo was doing a decent job in pegging him to at least being under a pit stop in terms of a distance away but at the very least Red Bull came away with a one too so that's pretty much all I need to say you know 57th win good job Max well done move on. Now, I don't care how much stick I get for this, I stand by it. Logan Sargent to me was a winner today, simply because of just how much he had to put up with. Yes, you might be thinking I'm absolutely bonkers for the fact that Logan was last on the road, even slower than the Alpines. But when you look at the race in context and all the stuff that was going down, Logan really did the best that he could, given that so many things were stacked against him. Yes, of course, he had that incident in practice where he did crash. He was driving a chassis that used to be Albon's, which was repaired. And reportedly, if you repair a chassis, it adds weight regardless of what you want, about 100 grams or so. That may not sound like much, but it's still heavier. And then, of course, he goes into the race having to do what he can. He then sees his teammate crash out in his original chassis. So already that's annoying. He then has some really good overtakes and is going up the field like stink. He's in 11th at one point. He's almost scoring points. And then he's in that gaggle of cars, about four or five coming into the pits all at once. And then the, the pit crew bottle it. He then has a slow pit stop. He then has to have three pit stops over the course of the race. Then he's last. And then he goes off at Degna too. Which, by the way, many people did this weekend, including Checo and Charles. So this wasn't an exclusive sergeant situation. But considering all of the stuff that he had to put up with, all the stuff that's been going on with Williams, how I thought for the longest time they were the ultimate paragons. But over the last couple of races, they've really not been doing their PR department any service. They've been doing everything to rub people up the wrong way. I've been really patient with them. But Logan Sargent is doing everything he can to justify his position. But there are so many factors going against him right now. And then he goes and sees his teammate who's supposed to be the points hauler crashing. I think Albon's had more crashes than Sargent this season at this point. He's got one arm tied behind his back. He's doing the best he can. So as far as I'm concerned, he did a darn good job today. And I'm going to give him a W. I don't care if you think it's a pity W, I'm going to give him a W nonetheless because he needs it and he needs to know that he's doing a fairly good job. But one person who definitely did a good job was Fernando Alonso. He made those softs sing. And yes, of course, he was the one who didn't get the upgrades by priority, but I'll explain more as to why later. But either way, he bounced back from all of that. He got the upgrades in FP3 and for Quali. And then from then on, he seemed to be a guy possessed. And in interviews, he said that this was one of the best races he's ever had in that everything was complete. He was competitive. He was racing Mercedes genuinely. He wasn't all that far away from Lando Norris. So he could have been tempting himself going for the top five, but he decided to remain conservative and bag another P6, which once again is showing that even though Aston Martin could potentially be in no man's land in fifth place, Fernando is able to drag that car to positions where you can then describe them as being sometimes the third or fourth fastest if you put it in the hands of Fernando. If you're new to Formula One, by the way, I recommend you go back and watch the 2012 season where Fernando is driving a similar car in the hierarchy, a Ferrari, and it wasn't really a good car at that time, but he was able to make that car work and even bag a couple of wins and go for the title. This was a really good example of one of those races where you would look at Alonso and go, yep, yep, he's a pretty darn good driver. How old is he? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't know that he's in his early 40s. He, he's like he's in his late 20s. He's in his prime right now. He's loving life. And another person who's loving life right now is the likes of Checo. I've actually had a script in the works over the last few days, and I will be releasing it in the next couple because I think this weekend has proved positive that this season, Checo is going about things in a much better manner. In terms of what he's trying to do, he's looking at Max instead of as a championship contender or rival as a benchmark. 
if he can get close to Max Verstappen, then he'll know that he'll be driving to the best of his ability and that that day would be a good day. And considering that in qualifying, he was less than a tenth behind Max in the same car, that's really good because Checo's struggles this year have been in qualifying as well as in last year, but he seems to be getting a better handle of it. And he might have been even closer to Max had he supposedly not had balance issues in the first stint. And supposedly this was only the third Red Bull lockout of the front row in six years. He's making a really strong case to remain at Red Bull for the sake of consistency, at least for one more year. This is a really strong time of it, especially after all that happened last year, where this is probably one of the worst races of Checo's career because it was just so utterly embarrassing. Now, it's the complete opposite. So well done, Checo. This was a brilliant race. Yes, of course, he had an incident at Degner, but he was able to recover from that, and that didn't spoil his day. He was able to get yet another P2 and show that, yeah, he can actually bag second place in the Drivers' Championship maybe a little bit earlier than expected. Yes, of course, there's still plenty of time left and he could easily go off the boil. But based on what he's been saying, he's actually saying all the right things to have a really good mindset into thinking second place, not title. At least not yet. If Max has a wobble, then maybe he can have a go. But so far, well done, Checo. I'll get over this one really quickly. I feel like Valtteri Bottas does deserve a little bit of a mini W for this one. When the car was on song, he was making plenty of overtakes. And it just goes to show, if the car is working with him, with Valtteri, he can actually put that car in the points paying positions if one of the other cars in the top five is faltering. He's really competitive and he seemed to be really on form. And considering that the pit stop issues weren't nearly as bad this time out, they still weren't great. I mean, the commentators, again, lauding a four second pit stop as fantastic for Salva, that is still something they need to work on, but hopefully for Shanghai, they might have a fix for it. Unfortunately, they still fell off toward the end where they ended up like around about 13th, 14th or something. Nothing to write home about, but still not near the points. But still, Bottas, little wins. But a big win comes from the likes of Yuki Tsunoda. Now, I know, 10th place, it's not all that much to write home about, but remember last year where Yuki Tsunoda was bagging all those P10s at the beginning of the season, practically saving the morale of Alpha Tauri? He's doing more of that here. In the wake of Daniel Ricciardo having that argy-bargy with Alex Albon, Yuki Tsunoda once again gets into Q3 and stays in the Q3 positions, gets the 10th place, the first Japanese driver to do it at home since Kamui Kobayashi got that podium in 2012, and really gave the Japanese fans something to sing about. I was actually watching an interview, and he actually realized that the incident in Bahrain and the cooldown lap was a bit of a wake-up call. He recognized that what he did was wrong, he owned it. And that's something really important, my friend, to remember, is that so long as you can be aware of what you did was wrong and you own it, you don't try and deny it, then you can take that on board and grow. And I think Yuki checked himself and went, hey, if I want to remain in Formula 1, I can't keep doing that. And right now, the momentum is squarely in his favour. Seven points now, and they're all from Sonoda. And so far, he's been doing the business. In the wake of Daniel having a struggle or having a crash in this time out, he's now been able to provide some crumbs of comfort and give Racing Ball something to sing about. And also, go back and watch that pit stop gaggle. That was amazing footwork and coordination that Yuki Tsunoda came out of the middle of it and then came out of the front of it. Yuki was singing their praise and saying, good job, top job, excellent. He was giving people something to sing about. That was a really good job from the pit crew. Something that Salva really needed to take notes from. But Yuki, this was a fantastic time for him. And I think really a good strong case in him trying to convince the top bods at Red Bull for him to even be considered for partnering Max Verstappen. Or at least, you know, saying to Honda, hey, Maybe with Aston Martin, who knows? Now, Ferrari, and quite frankly, the clowns have left the pit wall because that pit strategy for Charles Leclerc doing a one-stopper, that paid off quite well. He started off in eighth, and had he done a two-stop strategy, according to the simulations from F1, he would have been P7. And to get P4 on the road is a brilliant result for Ferrari and really cementing them as the second best team by quite a bit as of now. And sure, Charles Leclerc was subject to team orders and he had to let Carlos Sainz buy, but considering where he might have ended up down in the second half of the top 10, and he ended up being really close to the podium, I think he will take that. It's not ideal, and it was unfortunate that he really couldn't be there in Q3, but this was something to savour, that instead of just getting a meagre 6 points, he ended up with a decent chunk that is 12 points. Not too bad keeps him in the title hunt, somewhat, and at least keeps him competitive and close to the likes of Carlos Sainz. So, yes, I definitely think this was a good time for Charles, considering he had a bit of a so-so beginning in qualifying. But Carlos, once again, it just goes to show, 
every single race that he's been in, he's been on the podium. And it's just really a statement of intent for all concerned that he really wants to get his future sewn up really quickly. And Ferrari, I think, are going to miss him to some degree. But yeah, I think this was one of the best performances from the Ferrari pit crew in ages. And this was the best Japanese Grand Prix result Carlos has ever had. He's never been on the podium before. Now we get to the meh category, and I've got to start this off with McLaren. Yes, of course, they were competitive. They did have their moments. They are definitely the third fastest team. But I'm not going to lie. That pit stop strategy of bringing in Lando that early to cover George Russell was just simply nonsensical. Lando had pace, and sure, Lando's car was suffering from a little bit of deg, but I didn't think it was that bad. And even Lando was a little bit dubious of the pit call, but he was able to make it work and he still ended up in the top five. But considering that he actually qualified in P3 and he looked like he was going to give the Ferraris a run for their money, I think the time lost with that pit stop strategy might have actually made the difference between him finishing fifth and fourth just ahead of Charles. Granted, that Ferrari qualified lower, but still that would have been a nice little thing to take away from Suzuka, especially from what McLaren were able to do last year. Yes, of course, their result wasn't as good as last year, but they're still closer to Red Bull. They still don't quite have enough to be able to get past them. Norris did the best he could. And as for Oscar, I feel like he can take some crumbs of comfort from this because he was able to manage his tires better. He was not far away from all of the other drivers, and I bet he will be kicking himself from losing it at the last lap to George in that last corner, but I think he was rattled from that incident where George pushed him off. The stewards decided there was no further action to be needed, so, you know, swings and roundabouts, but I think Oscar, he did have a decent time of it, but I think that last lap incident, that's going to knock him around for a little bit. I think he'll be stewing on that, but McLaren, it was fine. It was all right decent chunk of points and it still cements them in p3 and the constructors and as a mclaren fan i will still take that p3 that is still good uh mercedes the one-stop strategy oh well sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't i'd say the results were mixed but it did prove to me that george russell has a better understanding of the w15 because he was able to make it work he seemed the more versatile driver there were moments where lewis hamilton seemed quite on it he seemed quite happy with it but then there were moments when he wasn't and he was going change the strategy and he was just getting impatient but then it would suddenly come back to him again and then he would come up with a decent result even though in the press conferences later he seemed a bit morose but it seemed that the car was slowly coming back to him and in practice he did say that the car was feeling the best that it had in years it seemed a bit more consistent a little win for Mercedes that the W15 is slowly getting there. They're starting to understand the car, but it's going to be a slow burner. I don't think they're going to be solving it overnight and then they're going to be right back up to where McLaren are. It's going to be taking up until the likes of the Canadian Grand Prix or something for them to get even get close to thinking that way. But it's still something that they should really take comfort in. And their strategy was somewhat dynamic. They tried something bold at least. So they tried something different instead of just wallowing with the convention. They had a decent chunk of hard tires. There were things going for them. And I do feel like George is the stronger of the two drivers right now. But Lewis, he gave it a good shot. And he is being a team player. It was his decision, by the way, to let George through. So he was thinking for the team at that moment. Then I would say maybe Haas, because sure, they didn't score any points. Hulkenberg was close, though. He nearly did it again. I will say one thing is that Haas look like they are getting a handle on the infamous tire bug. Their tire deg looks like it's improved. They just seem more optimistic that they have a chance at points instead of just languishing at the back like Alpine are right now. They seem to have a sense of direction. The momentum is in their favor. They just seem happier. Considering all of the tumultuous emotions that Haas have had over the last few years, ever since Rich Energy came along, I'll take this. Haas just deserve a moment to be just content, calm, happy, working on themselves, and then being able to go from there. So Haas, I would say, this was all right, not too bad. Even though Magnussen was being uh, quite cheeky when it came to weaving with Bottas, that was a that was a little bit um, daring. I think the patience with you and the stewards will be wearing thin after the likes of Jeddah and now this. Now we get to the losers. And before I talk about the two most obvious candidates for this, I want to talk about Alpine briefly. I won't go into too much detail because I, they've had enough. Despite the fact they had some upgrades and at times they looked like they had some things to be happy about, the fact remained is that supposedly there was a little bit of a coming together which resulted in both cars sustaining damage. Thusly, it meant that they were at least 20 seconds down the road from anybody else, which meant that Alpine were very much propping up the back except for the fact that Logan Sargent was having an even worse time of it, having so much bad luck come his way, which meant that he was technically lost on the road. 
that it had not been the case, Alpine were the slowest team. I will say that Ocon was the stronger of the two drivers on the day, but Gasly, that was quite sloppy. I know he's trying to position himself as a team leader, but this was not a good case for that. Gasly, you really need to sort that out. It's these kind of things between Ocon and Gasly I worry more about than the big crashes that make headlines and look really good on TV. Just these little things, you know, banging wheels here, colliding things, touching, contact, those kind of things that are over in the blink of an eye, which can easily wreck one of their races or both of their races. So yeah, Alpine, not much more to be said. They were losers. Then of course there was Lance Stroll, compare and contrast. Whilst Fernando Alonso was making that car dance and getting P6 on the road, Lance Stroll wasn't having nearly as good time. Even though he had a set of soft tyres to hand as well, he wasn't really being able to make much progress. And when you get him behind a DRS train, he can really not make progress. He needs clear air to be able to maximise his full potential. And then on top of that, you get another soundbite on the radio, Clearly, he's learning from the mentor Fernando Alonso. Remember, GP2 engine at Suzuka, no less. Lance goes, I see your GP2 engine, and then I raise you a different category. You just feel like he was really getting exasperated. I've not seen him this desperate or mad since Monaco 2022, when he crashed out of Q1 and he had a little bit of a scream. But still, this is really a big contrast. And even though people were saying, oh, they prioritized Lance because he's daddy's boy with the upgrades, there was an explanation for that because when he crashed in Jeddah, the team looked at the car and went like, yeah, we may as well bolt on the upgrades now instead of just bolting the old stuff on and then adding the new stuff. So it was just a matter of convenience for that regard instead of priority. But still, Lance is just once again faltering. He had a really good time of it in Melbourne when he got a P6. That was something to be commended. But then he doesn't score any points and this leads to Mercedes being able to get a little bit more of a gap. Granted, it wasn't much more of a gap, but it was still a gap. And if this keeps on going, then Aston Martin can kiss fourth place goodbye. No, I'm not saying that Lance Stroll should be kicked out right now, but this wasn't a great time of it, especially when you contrast it to what his teammate was doing. And that can easily be said for the likes of Daniel Ricciardo, probably one of the bigger losers today, simply for the fact that Yuki did so well. And of course, you got to peg in Alex Albon as well. Even though the stewards deemed it no further action because they deemed it as a lap one incident, there was a little nugget in there that made me think they were both very lucky this happened in lap one and not in lap two and beyond. Their view on that situation would have been different and there would have therefore been somebody to blame. I would say it was 70-30 Ricardo because Ricardo claims that he was looking at Stroll and that he was distracted. And that also he was then reeling from all of the stuff that Yuki was doing. He had a slow start. He was then trying to deal with him. Yuki got past and then he was able to get a distance between himself and Ricardo. Then Albon was there. He didn't see Albon. And then Albon had to react because he realized that Daniel hadn't seen him and therefore he had to overcorrect. And then he ended up on the grass. They clipped and then they ended up in the barrier. So yes, of course, I would say both were at fault to some extent, but Daniel slightly more so because this is lap one. You need to be looking everywhere. But at the same time, Alex should have really realized that Daniel hadn't seen him a little bit sooner. And that overcorrection just exacerbated the situation. Had Alex been able to keep it on the road, I think they would have both been okay. And this is just making me think more and more and more that Alex Albon's stock is dropping by the race. Everyone thought at the beginning of the season, Alex would be a shoe in in scoring points for Williams. A point here, a point there, maybe a cheeky two pointer there. I even predicted he might even bag a top five result this season. But that's looking less and less likely simply for the fact that Williams barely have any resources and both drivers are leading to hefty repair bills. Both drivers, not just Logan. Even though the team endeavored to put more downforce on the car, so that means they wouldn't have to drive on the ragged edge, it just seems to continue to happen. It just makes Ted Kravitz's comments about why do you keep crashing cars all the more prudent, even though it's not exactly professional. It's true, it's happening. It just means the parts that Williams have to hand are getting less and less, and they might even have to resort to FW45 parts, or even have to cobble together a hybrid FW45B, a modified 2023 car for future races if their chassis keep breaking. And that's just gonna look that they're even more in dire straits, even though they're not. This is a very painful time of it, the transition to be able to be a better team, but they're really, really suffering right now. They don't really look good right now. And Albon, yeah, he doesn't look as bulletproof either. He looks just as crash prone as Logan, and that's, uh, that's not great. And as for Daniel, oh, Yes, I know this was an incident between two drivers, yes, but 
it's a result that he did not need. He's going to leave himself wide open for yet another session of Dr. Marco bashing. And then on top of that, Yuki bags another point. He outqualifies Daniel again. You go back to the Q2 cooldown lab. There was a little coded message saying that, yes, Daniel, I know that you always want to do a little better, meaning that they expect you to do a little better, but they still have to pat him on the back, say great job. It felt a little condescending and that it was something that Daniel needed to hear. Yuki goes and bags a point in his home race where Daniel wasn't able to do so. So Yuki's going to be on cloud nine right now. He's going to be so thrilled. He's going to be feeling so assured that his place in Formula One is secure, whereas Daniel's plans are falling apart. It's just getting really messy or it could be getting very spicy. As I talk about in this video here, where the hunt for the second Red Bull seat is getting very interesting indeed.